Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mark Rudolph, Chief Experience Officer with Sound Physicians. I'm sitting in for Dr. John Berkmeyer, who uh, couldn't be on the call today. Thanks very much for, for being with us for this first installment of the COVID-19 clinical webinar. Our goal is to provide clinicians with effective clinical and safety information as well to support the patient care efforts that all of you are making uh, and also keep you safe during this largely unprecedented clinical experience, uh, at least in the United States. I'd like to just go over a couple of housekeeping items. We're going to be opening up the webinar to attendees um, to offer their questions at the end. So for those of you who have questions during the webinar, go ahead and type them in at the bottom of the webinar control panel, and then we'll address them at the end of the session. Additionally, if you'd like to review the webinar later or share it with your team or something like that, we are recording it, so it'll be posted on the Sound Institute later today. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'm very excited that we have uh, our, our presenters today, Nate Ruck, who is Chief Medical Officer of Sound Emergency Medicine, and Sergio Zanotti, who is not Chief Medical Officer of Sound Emergency Medicine, but is in fact CMO of Sound Critical Care. Sorry about that, Sergio. Um, Nate and Sergio have been communicating with their clinical teams in their respective uh, clinical lanes and had the great idea to make this a clinician-wide event, these communications. And so we're excited for this installment, this first installment of the COVID-19 clinical webinar. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nate Ruck. Nate? Thanks, Mark. So our agenda for the call is going to be, you know, first some introductory comments, most of which we've heard, and then a report of what the latest situation from the field is, a discussion led by Sergio of clinical best practices, some discussion of operational guidance with a focus on what to do with colleagues who are exposed, some discussion around well-being and clinician support, and with the remaining time, we will do question and answer. So I want to start just by saying thank you for all you do. This is, you know, the job that we do as clinicians is stressful among the best of times. And, you know, I, I suspect that the resolve of many will be tested as we move forward and face this challenge. I will say that I've been humbled by the no-nonsense, can-do attitude that I've seen at the site level by our frontline clinicians and by our regional leaders. I know that the best path forward is, is paved by facts and not fear. So without further delay, we'll get directly into the information. So the epidemiology of this virus is still evolving. What we do know is that it's a novel beta coronavirus, which is from the same family of viruses that cause SARS and MERS. Unfortunately, it's much more transmissible than either SARS or MERS, and the main mode of, of transmission is respiratory droplet. And hopefully a theme that you'll pick up that's woven through this presentation is the importance of protecting yourself to prevent you know, infection um, in you, in your family, and in your patients. And you know, I, I'm gonna remind everyone now to pay especially close attention when Sergio talks about best practices with regard to use of personal protective equipment. We're still learning what the um, case fatality rate is for this virus. I think really at this point in time, the best information on, you know, the best estimate of the case fatality rate comes from the country which has done the most testing, which is South Korea. South Korea has drive-through testing, and if you look at how many tests performed in a country versus population, you know, in terms of tests per million of population, you know, they're really far ahead. The good news from their experience is that, you know, the, the case fatality rate is much lower than some um, previous estimates, obviously still quite a bit higher than a typical seasonal flu. And the other piece of good news or, or silver lining in the epidemiology data so far is that children under the age of 10 appear to be spared from most of the serious cases. We do know, you know, as I'm sure everybody on the call is aware that older patients and others with, with comorbid conditions are at much higher risk. So today there's widespread community transmission in the United States, and this is evidenced by the geographic distribution of new cases. You know, our, our knowledge of the true extent of transmission is 
incomplete due to the fact that you know the availability of testing is is not widespread yet and you know today a poll of ed directors from um, really all quadrants of the country reviewed revealed that in some cases we're still waiting three days for test results and test availability you know remains a problem i think what is certain is that there'll be a market increase in confirmed cases over the next several weeks as uh, the number of patients tested increases. I think it's also likely, based on the experience of others, that the distribution of cases is not going to be even. There will be uh, lumpy, you know, hot spots where, and this is already clear in what's happening in Westchester County, what's happening in California, and what's happening in uh, the Puget, greater Puget Sound area. We also know from prior outbreaks and particularly prior coronavirus outbreaks that this virus is likely circulating in the community for three or four weeks before the first diagnosed case. So with all, all that being said, I don't think any of us sh should be surprised to see a dramatic increase in the number of confirmed cases over the next several weeks. The best resource for tracking um, the geographic distribution of confirmed cases and keeping an eye on what's happening in terms of mortality that I've come across is this uh, dashboard that's put together by the Johns Hopkins System Science and Engineering School. And there's a link to that in this presentation, which would be available for everyone. The, you know, if you look at what's occurring in the U.S. in terms of, you know, even with our incomplete testing, you know, there's, there's really an exponential progression of cases over the last few days. And, you know, we certainly expect you know, continued doubling rate that's going to be measured in days over the coming week or two. So this is that resource list. The first, you know, is probably the one that's most important for frontline clinicians, which is the CDC. You know, this is a evolving situation and sometimes best practices and information change quickly. I would encourage you to um, really use the the linked web resources rather than relying on printed material or even a week from now, if you were to view this slide deck, some of the information may be inaccurate. The second link is for the dashboard, which I showed. The third is a link to uh, Sergio's Critical Matters podcast. He released an episode today and has one prior episode, which I think are must listen for frontline clinicians. The final thing I would suggest is that the Center for Health Security has a email list, which is outstanding, which provides, you know, really a non-partisan and easily digestible bullet-pointed um, compendium of daily news. So let's talk a little bit more about testing. There will certainly be a market increase in test availability over the next four or five days. LabCorp and Quest have added this uh, test to their menu of available tests. And there's some, in the, the test, you know, this, um, test was rolled out through an emergency use exemption, which is a little bit of an unusual pathway. And we don't know exactly what the test characteristics are in terms of, you know, what's the negative predictive value? You know, how many false positives and false negatives are we going to see? These things are a little bit unclear. We do have a pretty big body of knowledge from other PCR, um, you know, NAT tests. And what we do know is that the test is likely positive in the presence of disease, but it may lack negative predictive value. And I think we've seen that play out a little bit already in, you know, people that are have been required to have two negative tests to be let out of quarantine, and they have a negative test, and then they have a subsequent positive test. I don't think that should be interpreted as reinfection, and what's more likely is that they had a false uh, negative test in the in the interim test. So I, it's an important thing to keep in mind clinically in that, you know, tests like this don't have great power to rule out disease. So if you have someone who has the clinical phenotype of COVID-19 and they have a negative test, they may indeed still have it. Now, the local, the pathway toward testing is certainly also going to change over the next few days for most of us. In many states, you know, local and state health departments are still controlling who gets tested. As the uh, community laboratory testing ability ramps up, you know, that's likely to change. So I'm going to let Sergio take over from here for a little while and, and take us through some clinical best practices and clinical guidance. Thanks, Nate. This is uh, Sergio Sanotti. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Sound Critical Care. 
And uh, I'm gonna go through some clinical guidance. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to echo uh, Nate's sentiment and really thank our frontline clinicians for all the work that they're already doing and the work that will come in the days to come most likely. I think that information and knowledge is power. And what we're trying to do is based on the uh, most recent and best available evidence, share with you some uh, information that we think is actionable and can help you in taking care of these patients. This is summarized in a very uh, simple document that uh, was available last week and has been updated yesterday and will be available again to our, all our clinicians throughout through the OWL Center, but also we'll try to make it on Sound Connect and distribute it uh, to everybody who's registered for the, for the webinar. So uh, we can start, Nate. The next slide. What I wanted to emphasize is this is a very important graphic that comes from the CDC. And really, I think it's very important for us as clinicians, but also as bearers of information to our communities to really explain to people what we're trying to achieve. Uh, COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus is already in, in our communities. It's already disseminating within communities. So really what we're trying to do is flatten the curve and really decrease that peak so as that we don't overwhelm our current healthcare system capacity and maybe extend these cases over time. And this requires not only vigilance uh, at the hospital level in terms of how we interact with patients, how we interact with our colleagues, but also how we lead our teams, but also might have a lot of uh, effect based on what is done at a community level. So if people ask you about information and, and make sure that people understand that this is what we're trying to achieve. And I think it's not only protecting ourselves and our families, but also the communities in which we, we work, but also we live. So uh, what I'm gonna do in the next slide is start talking about different aspects of our clinical guidance. This is gonna be divided into a triage, a diagnosis, um, supported a, um, infection protection and control, uh, supportive care, specific care, and then some clinical uh, pearls that might be useful. Uh, this is specific to severe acute respiratory illness with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. I think that uh, we deliberately chose to focus on this uh, specific aspect of COVID-19 because our feeling is that the majority of our uh, clinicians will be dealing with the patients that are gonna be hospitalized or being hospitalized. And uh, really we wanted you to focus on, on, these, on these patients. So at this point with community spreading, I think it's very important for us to have a very low threshold in terms of thinking of somebody as a potential COVID-19 patient. Um, we sus suspect COVID-19 in any patient with severe acute respiratory illness, uh, of unknown origin who presents with any of the following, fever, cough, or shortness of breath. So as you can see, this is very broad, broad in terms of its scope, and we should really be very vigilant and making sure that we are isolating these patients appropriately and taking the right precautions. How do we define severe acute respiratory illness? It's defined by a acute respiratory illness that requires hospitalization. So this is not only for patients going to the ICU, this is for anybody who are thinking of bringing to the hospital. If they have an acute respiratory illness and have a fever or a cough or shortness of breath or any combination of those three, we should be suspecting COVID-19. Still very important in terms of, of triage is to um, think about travel history in the last 14 days. And obviously there's an expanding list of places with uh, community transmission and also any exposure to documented COVID-19 patients would also be very important. Um, one thing I wanna share, uh, and this is obviously not something that's been published extensively in peer reviewed journals, but I think that it, as the information comes and we start connecting dots, it just struck me as something that our hospitalist colleagues would wanna hear about and also our ED colleagues. I know that um, we have had cases of exposure uh, within our, our clinicians and one specifically that I had a chance to, to look at involved a patient admitted with DKA, who later develops respiratory symptoms in the hospital and tested positive for COVID-19. Now, um, when we admit patients with other conditions that are usually exacerbated by infections, we should also be thinking of COVID-19. And as a matter of fact, based on communications I've had with intensivists in Spain, they are seeing a significant proportion of ketoacidosis as a, by, as a byproduct 
of COVID-19 infections. So I think that um, we have to be very vigilant and think about why did this patient develop DK? Why is this patient having this exacerbation? And we're very liberal in terms of applying the, the label of suspected COVID-19, especially in communities where there's significant dissemination within the community. So the second portion of this is about infection prevention and control. And this is probably the most important action that we need to be taking at a hospital level in terms of protecting our patients, protecting ourselves, and protecting our teams. The number one thing that I think we should be uh, thinking of, and this is applies to our ED colleagues, but also people elsewhere, is in any patient who, e who might be suspected of being a COVID-19 patient, as soon as possible to initiate source control. Source control is defined by the CDC as placing a surgical mask on the patient. And this is very important as soon as they arrive to triage, as soon as they, we identify them, the first thing that we should do is put a surgical mask on these patients, making sure that we decrease the risk of exposure uh, to other people and to other patients. Like Nate said, the main form of transmission is through droplets. Therefore, all patients should have droplet and contact precautions, all suspected or confirmed cases. Initial recommendations from the CDC included airborne precautions, as the number of cases is increasing, revised uh, recommendations from the CDC uh, that were published on March 10th are encouraging hospitals to prioritize their airborne precautions and to really utilize those preferentially as they run out of rooms for those patients who are gonna undergo aerosol generating procedures. And that might include uh, intubation, bronchoscopy, non-invasive ventilation, and, and some other ones. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later, but just as you uh, as you will might you might find clinically that as the number of cases increases that we might run out of airborne um, negative isolation rooms. I think that it's still very important that we utilize airborne precautions for the high aerosol generating procedures, but also it's very important to re-emphasize that the main mode of transmission that has been proven is droplets. So applying droplet and contact precautions to every single patient is very important. In some EDs, in some hospital wards, in some ICUs, eventually I can imagine that some hospitals will start grouping these patients together geographically, but that is something that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss further as the numbers increase. In terms of uh, um, frequent deliberate hand washing, the most important task that we can do personally and encourage our teams to do. What do I mean by deliberate hand washing? It's hand washing with soap and water for 20 seconds or more, including your thumbs, which are often not uh, taking good care in hand washing, and to be very deliberate about how we do that uh, with every interaction that we have as we touch things throughout the day. The other way of uh, washing your hands appropriately would be to use an alcohol-based product that has 60% or more of alcohol and do that for 30 seconds and allowing it to, uh, to dry spontaneously. The most important thing uh, after hand washing is the appropriate use of personal protective equipment. And I'll show you how to proper um, donning and doffing of this equipment. If we can advance the slide, Nate. So what do you need to see these patients? Well, you need a gown, and that's the first thing that you should put off after you wash your hands. You need a mask or a respirator, so ideally, as our N95 um, respirators uh, supply is available, and there are strategies that we can discuss to make sure that we, we use them as best possible, an N95 fitted mask, so you haven't been fitted and you're going to be seeing patients with COVID-19, um, uh, especially you're going to be doing procedures that might include a high aerosolized of droplets, you should be fitted for your N95. Make sure that you know not only um, how to apply it, but also how to self-test yourself for any leaks. Um, if you don't have an N95, you put a surgical mask on. If you're not gonna do an aerosolized procedure and you're just walking in and out of the room in a lot of institutions in order to uh, save the N95s for the higher risk uh, procedures, that, that will be what, what would be recommended and that is okay with the CDC as, as of now. After you put your respirator or your mask, you need goggles or a face shield. So if you use glasses, eye prescription glasses or contact, that does not suffice. You need a face shield that covers your whole face and has 
and doesn't have leaks or to use a protective goggles that are meant for, for this. I think in most hospitals, probably face shields is what's gonna be available and this is gonna be disposable. Very, very important. And the final step is to apply, your, uh, is to apply uh, gloves. So once you are properly um, gowned with this PPE that I wanna emphasize includes a gown, mask or respirator, goggle or face shield, and gloves, you enter the room, take care of the patient. Once you are ready to go outside, if you are in a room that has an ante room, you can, you can uh, remove the personal equipment in the ante room. If you're not in a room with an ante room, you probably wanna remove this on, before you leave the room and leave it in, in the room. But um, the proper way to remove this is very important. And I think that in some situations, especially in high aerosolized situations, you might wanna have a, a buddy system where somebody can spot check you and go through the same sheet that's available in, in the document that I'll send. But basically you start with your gown and gloves and you can do this all at once. And as you remove you, uh, the gown, you only touch the inside in order to remove your gloves. You dispose the gowns and gloves appropriately and you wash your hands. And this is a very important step. Uh, if you wash your hands in between each step, you significantly reduce the risk of self-contaminating yourself. So the next step is to remove your goggles or your face shields. And once you do that and dispose that, you wash your hands again for 20 seconds or more. Once you have removed the goggle or face shield, you remove your respirator or your mask. In most institutions, if, you, if you're wearing a mask, that's gonna be disposable in all institutions. And for the respirators, I do know that um, there are strategies to try to um, preserve our supplies of respirators. So I know that in hospitals that I have worked, what we have done is um, each provider will get an N95 that's fitted to them, the people who will be involved with these patients, and they keep that N95 mask for the rest of the day. And that is okay to use unless it gets soiled. If it gets soiled, you need to change it. But I think that Preserving these N95s as much as possible is going to be important, especially if we, we, if we eventually face uh, problems with supply. And again, after you have removed the respirator, you once again wash your hands, like we said, 20 seconds or more deliberate washing with, hand, uh, with soap and water or 30 seconds or more of an alcohol-based product. So this is something that I would recommend you reviewing as you as the days as you start working clinically and you have other patients who are isolated for contact precautions or for any other precautions that are not COVID-19, when you remove and when you put your 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 um, PPE on, do it in a deliberate way, practice, pay attention, and definitely, I mean, think about uh, discussing this with your team and working on this education as, as a group. I think this is probably the single most important slide that we should be sharing with people at the hospital. And it's the one thing that not only we can do to protect ourselves, but to protect others and also to help flatten that curve. So now let's go into diagnosis. I, I think that as, as a lot of these cases, when we first see them, will be presumed uh, and we don't know for sure what they have. I think it's very important to remember that we should still do the regular diagnostic tests that we do for these uh, respiratory diseases. So obviously blood cultures, prior to antibiotics as per sepsis protocols, viral panels. We are still seeing influenza A and B. Uh, that's actually up, there's an uptick in those admissions. Uh, the CDC and all the ev evidence that we have so far would indicate that if you document a specific pathogen uh, on uh, an admission, it is very less, very, um, uh, it's much less likely that this would be COVID-19. So if it's influenza A, for example, it would be influenza A, the precautions would be the same. So it doesn't change the way we would manage these patients, but I think it's important to not forget that. In terms of the testing, as Nate explained, uh, that's still handled at a very local level. We do anticipate that that will grow very quickly with uh, lab corps and lab and Quest uh, starting to do in some of our hospitals, these tests. Um, it's done by basic collection of a sample from the upper and lower tract if possible. And then it's a, a rapid a reverse transcriptase PCR that uh, that is done. Uh, lymphopenia is the most common laboratory finding. Even in cases where there's mild lycocytosis, there seems to be lymphopenia. That has been widely described in series from Europe and from Asia. Uh, procalcitonin is usually normal 
uh, and admission for these patients with COVID-19. This also has implications for care later in the ICU or on the floors. If somebody with COVID-19 were to deteriorate later on in their course in the hospital and you check a procalcitonin and it's now elevated, it is very likely that that, that indicates superinfection with a bacteria or nosocomial infection. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, other abnormalities on laboratory findings include ele elevated LFTs, two to four times normal of your AST and your ALT. That's been reported in up to 30% of severe cases, especially in the case series from, um, from China, which are the ones that are larger and are available in peer review right now. Imaging, the most common pattern is bilateral diffuse consolidations and ground glass opacities. It's also important to, to, to state that early on after immediate um, development of symptoms, many of these patients have normal x-rays or normal CTs and then slowly you can see with progression of disease, this, the imaging getting, getting worse. Routine CT is not recommended to diagnose COVID-19. I think that we probably uh, can't recommend it based on the fact that it wouldn't change management and that you're exposing other patients by moving patients around and you're also tying up the CT in terms of cleaning it up afterwards. Uh, if you see patients with fever, bilateral infiltrates and lymphopenia, think COVID-19. I mean, that seems to be a very classical pattern of the patients who are sicker and who get admitted to the floors and to the ICU. Next slide. This is just uh, to show you um, what the CT scan looks like. This is from a publication that was released a couple of days ago in Lancet, Infectious Disease. Um, and basically you can see this is a 77 year old male who eventually died from COVID-19 in China. Uh, day five after developing symptoms, there are some ground, ground glass opacities in the bases. By day 15, you can see now dense consolidations and progression of the ground um, glass opacities. And by day 20, you can see really dense consolidations and worsening of the picture in the CT. So that's kind of what we're seeing in the severe cases, but uh, it's a diffuse disease bilaterally, starts with a, a ground glass opacities and then develops into more consolidated patterns of pneumonia. So let's talk about supportive treatment. Uh, we start with giving supplemental oxygen. Targets for adults is usually to keep the, S, the saturation of oxygen above or equal to 90%. In pregnant patients, 92 to 95%. There is no uh, specific literature on pregnant patients. We traditionally will target a higher SAO2 in pregnant patients just because of their decreased functional reserve and the risk of uh, hypoxemia to the fetus. So these are just general guidelines for our ED hospice colleagues, but also we've talked with our critical care colleagues about this. The, be very cautious in applying non-invasive ventilation, such as BiPAP or CPAP, and high flow oxygen, such as Vapotherm devices. The reason that we're uh, urging you to be cautious is that these have been associated with high failure rates in COVID-19 and other viral pneumonias. Uh, it's also been associated in one, in one case series from, from China with increased mortality, probably because of delayed intubation. But the third reason, which I think is very important in the midst of a pandemic, is that these are usually associated or can be associated with increased aerosol, aerosolized spread of droplets and increased risk for patients, uh, for, for people caring for those patients. So in general, um, if we can avoid these or uh, if we need to go to early intubation is really the recommendation uh, for, for managing the respiratory failure. These patients, as I said, most of the time you will not have a firm diagnosis when you first see them. They could have bacterial pneumonias, they could have sepsis. So uh, initiation of early empiric antibiotics as per your sepsis protocol is still very important. Uh, we don't believe as of now that these patients have a high, uh, COVID-19 patients have a high association of specific super infections. One series from China uh, did have super infections with gram negative rods and fungal pathogens, but a lot of experts now believe that that could be associated to the widespread use of high dose steroids, which are contraindicated, and I'll touch on that in, in a little bit. So just uh, keep that in the, in the back of, of your mind and initiate empiric antibiotics for these patients when you first see them. If they're not in shock because of the respiratory issues, conservative fluid management is what's recommended initially, but also throughout the, throughout the care. 
in order to optimize uh, our oxygenation. As I said before, a lot of people talk about the inflammatory response in these patients. Um, the Chinese have used um, a lot of corticosteroids, but based on evidence from SARS, MERS, and what's ev evolving uh, with COVID-19, it is not recommended to routinely use corticosteroids in these patients. There is potential harm for these patients, and unless you have a very strong indication to give corticosteroids, it is not recommended that you give them corticosteroids. Like I said earlier, because of the high failure rate with non-invasive ventilation and the potential for increased um, contagion, a low threshold for intubation and placement on mechanical ventilation. Furthermore, what I'll also say is that from previous epidemics, what we have known is that healthcare workers are at a higher risk of getting infected during emergency situations. So anything we can do to make um, the situation more controlled makes sense. So I think that having a low threshold for mechanical ventilation and intubation is gonna be very important as we start seeing more cases. For all of you who intubate, uh, where your ED hospitalists or ICU physicians, do not intubate without proper PPE. This is a high aerosol generating procedure. This is when your risk is the highest. What do we mean by proper PPE? This is the situation where you absolutely wanna use an N95 mask, have a face shield, goggles, have your gown and your gloves. And when you are ready to remove your PPE, follow the same instructions that we said before. But this is definitely, I mean, a high risk situation for both you and for the uh, respiratory therapist helping you out. Um, I think that for all these patients, we wanna minimize the crowds, uh, crowd control and emergencies, but also just in general care to the minimal essential personnel. When you intubate these patients, it is recommended that you use a rapid sequence intubation. What does that mean? Is that you use an induction agent and then you use a paralytic. And also it's recommended that you minimize bagging. So basically pre oxygenate the patient and once you're ready to go after the RSI, you don't bag the patient anymore. You go ahead and intubate as quickly as possible. Two things that are very important in terms of minimizing exposure um, to the healthcare team is Number one, the most experienced person should be intubating these patients. So if you're in a teaching program, these are not the patients you want your trainees to be, to be intubating. And number two is to utilize technology that um, will increase the distance between um, the, 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 the performer, the intubator, and the, the airway. So glide scopes and CMAX or video laryngoscopy are preferred over direct laryngoscopy and I think they can decrease the operator exposure to droplets. So for all of you uh, who have these, I mean, and if you don't have it, it might be a good time to get it, but definitely something that I think we should be utilizing uh, to protect our teams. Once these patients get intubated, ARDS net protective lung ventilation, which really is centered around using low tidal volume. So the target is six mLs per kilogram of predicted body weight, and to keep the plateau pressures below 30 to 35 is the, is the goal. Other interventions, prone positioning has been shown to improve mortality in ARDS patients. And based on reports coming from Italy and from Spain, it seems to be a, a, a good, a, a, has good great effects in patients with COVID-19 ARDS. Um, other interventions such as neuromuscular blockers in some cases and ECMO, I think have been reported, but in lower numbers. Um, my recommendation is to focus on what you usually do. So if your hospital is not a hospital that, that does ECMO, this is probably not the start to doing ECMO. And if you transfer patients for ECMO, I think that you would use the same criteria as of now, and that might change as the situation on the ground evolves. Sergio, before we advance, can you say a few words? You know, many of these patients are gonna have abnormal lung sounds. Can you say a few words about nebulized albuterol versus meter dose inhaler? So I think that um, nebulized albuterol is going to be a high aerosolized um, uh, uh, droplet situation. So I think that we know that it's it's something that we use, utilize a lot in the hospital, uh, but I think that uh, MDIs would probably be the way to go uh, here. And, and once they're intubated, I think it's a lot safer to do them anyways. But I do think that that's an important point, and I didn't mention that. Thanks for bringing that up, Nate, because especially for those uh, on the floors and in the ED, uh, any nebulized medication uh, 
is going to create a high amount of aerosolized droplets, and that is probably not something that that is very uh, good for for the for the healthcare team. So let's move on to specific treatments for COVID-19, and no specific treatment for COVID-19 is currently available. So um, I think that's very important for us to understand because there are reports of people utilizing things on the field, reports coming from different situations. But as of now, there's no specific treatment. The way people have been saved with severe COVID-19 ARDS is by excellent supportive care. And that should be the emphasis right now. Having said that, I do wanna share with you two drugs that are antivirals and a third drug, just so you're aware of what's being published and what's been talked around. Um, remdesivir has been utilized in the United States and in Europe and in other countries. And it's an experimental broad spectrum antiviral that was created for Ebola. It does seem to have in vitro antiviral um, activity against the virus that produces uh, COVID-19, which is uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but we don't have any clinical um, data that confirms its efficacy. Right now in the United States, most of the patients who have received remdesivir so far have received it on a compassionate basis use from the manufacturer. There are two clinical trials right now that are starting, they're NIH sponsored. One of them is sponsored by the manufacturer. And actually there's, actually there's two clinical trials there. One is for patients that are less severe, which would not be in the ICU. And the other is for patients who are more severe with ARDS in the ICU. And it's looking at remdesivir versus and placebo, that might be a channel to get patients on remdesivir. So I think that that would be something you, you should think about. The other trial that I mentioned is an NIH-based trial, a sponsored trial that is actually an adaptive trial that will actually test multiple therapies throughout the epidemic. And the first one they're doing is remdesivir. So if you have a patient, you can reach out to your pharmacy department, to your infection control, your local state agents to the manufacturer. I do believe that eventually the compassionate basis use will probably close and we should be getting uh, these, these drugs to patients through clinical trials so that we can actually measure the, the real impact they have and learn for future epidemics if this is something that would work or not. The other drug that has been used quite extensively in, uh, in Asia has been lopinavir and ritonavir. Uh, that has been reported in the Chinese series. There's a small series from Singapore. Hard to make any conclusions. This drug is also uh, known as Calitra, been utilized as a combination agent for HIV for a long time. Right now, there's also clinical trials ongoing. And I think, again, in consultation with ID and consultation with your local pharmacy team, uh, you could consider these. But I do think it's important for people to understand that these are not recommended by the CDC. I think if if, if possible, we should be applying them in, a, in, in trials so that we can really learn if these uh, drugs are uh, useful or not for the situation. And the third drug I wanted to mention is chloroquine, which is a drug that people have used for, for, um, uh, for, rheumatic uh, for, for rheumatological diseases. It is available. Uh, you could potentially prescribe that. Why is that being mentioned? Because in one in vitro, experiment that seemed to have antiviral effects. There's no proof that it works. Um, I think that we have to be very careful in terms of just prescribing things that other patients might need and has proven benefits. But I just shared this with you because I think that as people start dealing with these cases, obviously there's an, um, there's an inherent need we have to give things to, to act. And, uh, and I think you have to be just very careful in terms of what is, has been shown to work and what people just reported that they have utilized. And uh, um, again, treatment is 100% supportive. If we take care of these patients with the best supportive care, I think right now that would be the best evidence-based practice. Finally, just share with you some miscellaneous clinical pearls. Uh, the medium time from onset of symptoms to ARDS is eight days. So a lot of these patients have been sick for a week and then they start having worsening symptoms. Just remember that. With flu, a lot of times the pattern is very abrupt and very acute. So I've seen patients develop um, ARDS from flu in 24 to 48 hours. That does not seem to be the pattern that we're seeing with COVID-19. So also I think important when you're following patients, it's the second week that a lot of times, I mean, they get a little bit more 
complicated, so just keep that in mind. In the largest series published to date from the Chinese, uh, the critically ill patients that died, it had a median time from ICU admission to death of seven days. And uh, what we're seeing from multiple reports is that there's a higher risk of death with age. So patients who are 65 and older are at an increased risk. What has been reported based on the available data is that if you're 60 to 69 years old, your mortality is probably around 4.8%. If you are 70 to 79%, 70 to 79 years old, your mortality probably ranges from 14 to 50, I'm sorry, from eight, seven to 8%. And if you're 80 years or older, your mortality probably is 15% or, or, or larger. So clearly our older patients are at higher risk. People with comorbid conditions, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, are also at increased risk of death. And then the other two things that have emerged from a, a recent publication in Lancet are that for patients, um, patients who died were more likely to have an elevated D-dimer at one um, greater than one microgram per liter, and also increased SOFA scores on admission are associated with mortality. A SOFA score is a sequential organ failure assessment that can be very easily done. Uh, I have seen that some of our hospital systems that we partner with have included SOFA scores as a part of their triaging and decision making in case of a true crisis and trying to identify the patients who are very sick but are salvageable versus those who are not sick enough or too sick to be saved. But that's something that you should discuss at the local level in terms of what are the protocols in place. But just to share with you, this has emerged as identifiers of high risk of death. Other clinical pearls, main organ dysfunction is respiratory. These patients die from ARDS. Multi-organ failure syndrome seems to be less common than other causes of ARDS, such as influenza, although there's been reports of acute renal failure, of normal liver functions, and up to 30% of patients. These patients might have increased troponins, indicating uh, some cardiac injury. Arrhythmias have been reported. So just things that to follow on, but that, that seems to be less of, a, of an issue, except for the sickest of the sick but clearly the main organ that's affected and that ultimately kills these patients uh, are the lungs. Uh, in some of the, the, the early US uh, cases, the mortality of the severe cases has been very high, uh, but this may have been to these patients being elderly and rapid transitions to comfort measures by families. So if care is supportive and you're removing 100% of support, obviously these patients will have a very high mortality. So before I hand it back to, to Nate, my only comment is that we will keep a, abreast of what's developing. We'll update the, this document uh, at least every week. Uh, stay informed, like Nate said, go to the sources of the CDC. Uh, and really, I mean, uh, we're trying to share with you the best available evidence. I suspect that we'll learn more as we see more cases around the world and that information is published and shared. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it off to Nate, who will talk about exposures. Thanks, Sergio. That's a lot of great information, and we will continue to keep you updated on the best clinical information as it becomes available. And, you know, it's likely we'll have a call similar to this or a webinar similar to this on at least a weekly basis for the foreseeable future. So let's say a few words about guidelines for providers who are exposed. I think you know, really the two most important things are what Sergio discussed and what I mentioned in the beginning, which, you know, number one is good source control. Mask suspected patients, take early control of the airway through intubation in patients who are at high risk of deterioration. And second, make judicious and thorough use of PPE. I think everyone who is on the front line and caring for patients needs to practice donning and doffing PEE or PPE. And I would encourage you to consider using a buddy when doffing PEE, um, PPE to um, you know, point out flaws in your technique and ways in which you can do better. So the CDC has updated a number of times the guidelines. And I think as our healthcare system responds to this challenge, it's likely that these guidelines may change again. So this is another case where I think it's very important that you collaborate with your local health department, your facilities infection control officer, and 
you know, frequently check these CDC guidelines. They were last updated on March the 7th, and they made a couple of important changes. So asymptomatic low-risk providers were allowed to return to work, and they removed the active surveillance requirement for healthcare providers that were reporting back to work. And they made some, I think, really pretty excellent changes in the exposure categories, which makes it a lot easier. They align much more with what's likely to occur in the real world. And, you know, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but what I really want to highlight is that, you know, this first matrix of, you know, potential exposures is prolonged close contact. And this is when they're, um, you know, the patient is wearing a face mask when they're source control. And you can see if you review this and then contrast it with this where the patient doesn't have source control, you know, you, you could see that your likelihood of a of a high risk exposure is much greater in the event that you haven't exercised good source control. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the subsequent slides, but it's it's very important that hospitals become thoughtful about developing alternative entry points to their institution for those with fever and respiratory symptoms. And I know a lot of our hospital partners have already taken action in that direction. So that being said, there's a there's a range of possible outcomes as to what's going to occur here. And I think we can all agree that now is the time to calmly plan for the worst so that we can be best prepared to meet what comes our way. And to that end, I think being involved at your local level and participating in facility level planning is critical. One of the, the weak points in our healthcare system is the size of our physician labor force. We all know that many of our facilities, even prior to this outbreak, are running near capacity. So it's critical, given that you know you may experience infection or quarantine among your partners in your practice, that you have a great you know sit down now and do a tabletop exercise over what are possible options in the event that you know your labor force shrinks. You know who are all the credentialed providers? Are there are there recently retired people? in the community that are still on the medical staff? Are there physicians or APCs in, of, you know, other specialty stripes that can help in the event, you know, of a disaster? And I think the other thing that's important is to be in touch with others in your role in the community. I would encourage all the department level directors, whether they're ED, ICU, or hospital medicine, to reach out to the leaders in peer institutions nearby. This will give you an opportunity to share resources, to learn about best practices, to keep on top of what's occurring in the community. And the final thing is, I think, really the most important, the last bullet point on this slide, which is we really need to preserve capacity by utilizing resources toward those patients who are most likely to be helped. And in the US, you know, the ED provides tremendous access, but we have limited capacity. It's very important that the primary care physicians and nursing homes be good stewards of this limited resource that the ED provides. And, you know, low acuity patients that are simply looking for a diagnosis but don't require hospital level, level care should clearly be diverted, uh, diverted to other care venues and not to the ED. So telemedicine has a, a great application here. I think in the emergency department, we're um, hoping to move forward with using telemedicine for the history taking portion of initial evaluation of patients that require screening. Sound telemedicine has done a lot of great work and developed a rapid deployment program, which has a, a 72 hour roadmap to being live. You can reach out to them at uh, contact at soundtelemedicine.com for more information. Telemedicine really, I think, has an opportunity to do three things which really help us. One, it's a force multiplier and allows us to spread our clinical expertise geographically. Two, it minimizes your area under the curve in terms of exposure risk to patients who are infected. And three, it may decrease our PPE run rate. So I would you know, really encourage all of you to think about what applications are possible. And obviously there may be some things to work through from an IT standpoint at your institution. But now, before we're experiencing tremendous stress, is the time to have those meetings and discussions. At least one national telemedicine vendor is offering free licenses during the outbreak period. The Video is a company that the Emergency Medicine Service line has worked through before, and the URL that's on this slide is the best way to reach out to them for more information.
clinician well-being, I think that it's you know normal to experience fear and stress when responding and caring for patients during an outbreak like this. And it's critical that we support each other. It's critical that you know we're keeping an eye on each other and that the regional team and the national support is is here for the front line. We have a peer support program which goes live March 23rd. The employee assistance program I think will likely be as important as ever during this time. The peer support uh, email can be found below. Mark, I don't know if you have anything to add on clinician well-being. I want to give you a moment to to comment. Thanks, Nate. Um, thanks to both of you for your expertise and for putting this together. I uh, will make a comment about peer support. There will be a message going to the whole organization, uh, all clinicians, with the details of that program. It does have a kind of specific indication in that it's for those individuals who have had a patient care related experience that has left them feeling traumatized um, for one reason or, or another. So you'll see more information about that. Uh, and then, of course, the employee assistance program is accessible 24 7, 365 for any reason personal, financial, professional uh, challenges. And then, people support our um, human resources department can be uh, reached at this email address for any questions relating to your work, to your benefits, et cetera. And uh, I do think that this is, you know, this is a very challenging time. And the one nice thing is that we're all going through it together. And so that's, that is one thing, you know, we can um, relate to one another, share our experiences, and hope that people will, will do that. Thanks, Mark. So without, uh, further delay, we'll open things up for the remaining time for questions. Excellent. So we do we do have a, a there are quite a few questions here, and I just want to let people know that some of some of what's being asked here is going to be answered by some uh, soon to come communications um, for business colleagues and for clinical colleagues. So we'll do our best to get through this and then answer some of you directly afterwards if we don't get through. Uh, one question that I imagine is coming up frequently, somebody asked about COPD patients who have confirmed COVID illness uh, and the use of steroids. So I think that the the uh, um, the guidance there would be that that would be a situation in which probably you could use steroids, but I wouldn't use, I would use lower doses of steroids and for shorter periods of time. Even within COPD, I think that the evidence is overwhelming that we overdose and overtreat patients with steroids. So I think that shorter courses at lower doses would be recommended. But if you have like a, an indication like that, I think that it would be okay. Thank you, Sergio. A couple of people asked about the co-infection with influenza and COVID-19 is, first of all, is that possible? And if it's not possible, would a positive flu test suggest that you don't have to worry about COVID-19? Um, so based on what we know so far, the guidance possible is obviously a very loaded world, a word. I mean, I, I can't say it's not possible, but based on what has been learned so far with all the cases that have been studied, it, it is very unlikely. So the guidance is that if the patient tests positive for influenza, it is probably influenza, but the precautions should be the same. So it'd be very similar in terms of, I mean, you'd still have to be careful when you intubate, still need droplet precautions, still need to treat them in the same, in the same way. But I think that as of now, the, the CDC is recommending that it, that's why doing all this testing up front is important because it can help you discriminate who needs further testing for COVID and who might not be COVID but that might change and we'll keep you updated. Okay. What are the implications of COVID-19 and pregnancy? That is a great question that I think we have not answered yet. So um, we do know that from previous um, epidemics, actually the last pandemic we had was the H1N9 and that had a predilection for pregnant patients. We have not seen that with COVID-19. 
there's very little data on COVID-19 in pregnancy, but I think that um, uh, they don't, pregnant patients have not been identified as a super high risk, particularly for COVID, but obviously when they get sick, they always pose challenges for treatment because of the changes in physiology that we see with pregnancy, but also be, because, I mean, you're treating more than one patient. But uh, and there's, not, there's no specific guidance right now for pregnancy, but we will keep you updated on that. Okay. There's a question about surgical masks. Do we need to wear surgical masks all the time in the hospital, at a, at a minimum, a surgical mask in the hospital? So the recommendation for wearing surgical masks all the time in the hospital or outside of the hospital are only for those who would have symptoms. Uh, hopefully, if you have symptoms, you wouldn't be working, but it is possible that if you were exposed, that they might ask you to use a mask if you come back to work while you're waiting for the 14 days. And the reason is not to protect yourself, but to protect others. So I think the, the advice would be similar to what we are hearing for the CDC for people outside of the hospital. Um, if you're healthy, you shouldn't be wearing a mask at all times, uh, only when you're in close proximity to a patient who is suspected or proven to be COVID. And if you're sick, you should be wearing a mask in the hospital at all times as a patient. But we, we, we don't expect that at this point we would have sick healthcare providers coming to the hospital. For ED and ICU clinicians in particular who might be um, acutely intubating somebody, they may not have time. Well, what's your recommendation? What should they do about PPE in an emergency? Put your PPE on first prior yes. to intubating the patient in all circumstances. And I will also give you a, a little bit more of, a, 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 of the ethical response to that. The reason why you do that is that you are likely to cause more harm if you don't use PPE because you are likely to then become a super infector and you can cause more people to die. So um, that's why training and, and knowing how to put it is important. And that is also why I said that um, low threshold for intubation is very important so we can avoid those situations where uh, we wait, we wait, we wait, and then they crash. But I agree with, with Nate 100%. This is not the time. I mean, you're going to have to put the PPE in. You wouldn't intubate without an endotracheal tube. That takes time. You wouldn't. You shouldn't intubate without PPE, period, full stop. Can you comment on the certainty around the necessary length of quarantine for people that have been exposed? It's a best guess. I don't think that there's tremendously robust science behind it. And, you know, I think that recommendation may be refined as time goes forward. Okay. Um, if somebody is a, is a clinician and is pregnant, and you, you, you may not know the answer, if you don't know the answer, that's fine, but should they be caring for a COVID positive patient or not? And I don't I think, know the answer to that. Nate, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think that there's not great data on pregnancy. I would say that there also isn't compelling data that being pregnant puts you in a high risk category. I think it's a decision that clinicians will need to make collaboratively with their obstetrician. What about testing of uh, exposed clinicians? It's problematic because the test doesn't have great negative predictive value. And, you know, if, if community spread becomes tremendously wide, then, uh, you know, the test becomes even less powerful because, you know, the baseline rate of disease is higher. What many uh, places are requiring is two negative tests if you develop illness. I'm not aware, and I'd be anxious to, or interested to hear what Sergio has to say. I'm not aware of, you know, people that are exposed but asymptomatic requiring a test prior to coming back to work. Okay, I want to make one comment just because there are uh, a, there are a significant number of questions. First of all, there's a significant number of questions overall. There are a significant number of questions related to sick leave and quarantine and being paid if you can't work, et cetera. And I just want to make the comment that um, 
sound will not leave anybody in a position where they can't pay their bills and uh, generate their income. So I want to make sure you're aware of that. We are currently handling situations exactly like the ones you're asking about, and they're being dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out you know, what, what the best way to handle them is. So if you have a situation like that that is brewing, then obviously you should immediately notify your uh, your supervisor, your chief, or your medical director, and then they also they'll work with you along with um, our HR department. But I just want to reassure everybody: nobody's going to be in a situation where they can't work and can't get paid, and you know end up with cash flow problems. So please be assured of that. Um, we will do our best to take all of these questions and incorporate them into the subsequent webinars and or I'll work with Sergio and Nate and potentially we'll come up with uh, answers to these questions that we can then send around to people. If you uh, want any of these materials, you can email Nate directly at the email address that you see here. We will send a follow-up email to everybody that got invited to this webinar with links to anything that we mentioned uh, so that you'll have those right in front of you. A couple people asked about links to critical matters and other resources. Uh, and of course, if you have questions for Nate or Sergio, feel free to uh, email, email those as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time and attention. Thank you to Sergio and Nate. And of course, for everybody who is out uh, on the front line in the hospitals taking care of patients. Um, your expertise and commitment is, is appreciated and, and admirable. So. Thank you, and look for emails inviting you to the next uh, webinar in this series. Just, just one more comment from me before we end the call, which is that it's it's really important to me and to Sergio and to the rest of us at you know kind of supporting things nationally that we provide best in class clinical and operational resources. So please take the time to send us a note if there's something you want included in the materials that we present. We'll continue to have you know, a cadence of weekly, if not more frequent calls, and we'll do our best to synthesize the large amount of information that's out there and, and get you the best information that's available. Fantastic, thanks everyone.